Hi, everyone. Um, I, I'm saying a quick hello, waiting for other people to, to be joining, but a very big welcome to you all. Hello, Mona. Hello, Franklin. Hi, Mona. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> Someone hello, I know. Hello, Simon. <laughs> Hi. We'll just give people a, just a few more minutes before starting, because I've got a I've got a fantastic introduction to Sharon to give you. <laughs> well, it might not be that fantastic, but anyway, it'll be short, <laughs> which I'm sure that on its own is fantastic. Yeah. But I but I'm coming here tearing myself away from CNN coverage of what's going on in England, and in Scotland, mm. and it's so spectacular. Yeah, she she is. Too. And for those of you in the UK, my condolences. It's quite. Quite powerful what's going on. Yes. When, when for most of us, all of our life, she has been the queen, uh, mm -hmm. it is pretty significant. You know, when suddenly barristers are no longer QC, Queen's Council, they're now King's Council, but like overnight. Well, yeah, I've never known anything other than QC. No. It's kind of obvious, and yet these things, you know, it takes some getting used to. So, yeah, yeah. Well, we sang God Save the King last night. It was just weird. <laughs> Wait till you get to my age. Ah. You don't look any older than me, so you look, you look fine to me. Mm -hmm. Well, even in Canada, we sang God Save the Queen when I was a child in elementary school until a certain time when Canada asserted more independence and then it ended. But I, you know, I don't really remember when that was, but I, for sure, when I was quite young, we sang it every single morning. Right. I think I think we should let, let let's get going if it's okay. Hello, Julian. He's muted for the moment, but he won't stay muted for long if I know Julian well. <laughs> and hello, Doreen and Maria and Jill. Um, so, so if I may, may, may I please um, give an introduction? <coughs> Hi. Um, so. A warm welcome to everyone this evening. Uh, we're privileged to have Sharon Hart Green, the author of the book that we're reviewing this evening, come back for me with us tonight from Toronto. I think that's right, Toronto, where you yes. live, Sharon, to talk yes. about this work and to answer all of our questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to quote one of the reviews, uh, which said, this wonderful debut novel with great sensitivity and tenderness captures the emotional contours of loss and renewal that haunts the post-Holocaust universe. And even with all the grief that comes from such tales of lives ruptured and recaptured, Hart Green's novel is a joy to read. He then said, we will no doubt see more books from her because this I know is your first novel. Yes. He is apparently right um, because I, I have read Sharon that, and been told that you are currently on work, at work on a second novel about yes. the mystical indications of a young man in search of love. So. I'm sure we're all looking forward to <laughs> reading that too. So with that, Sharon, over to you. Okay, well, it's wonderful to be here and to be speaking in the UK. I know some of the people who have tuned in are from various places in the world, but but I was invited by Yad Vashem UK, which is delightful. And um, I've been to England and to Scotland in the past. So it's it's lovely to be back in a way, even though it's only on, on Zoom. Um, I know I'm competing with this enormous event in the UK, and I'm sure most people are glued to their television sets uh, over this terrible loss um, of the Queen. I think she was so beloved, and we feel it here in Canada as well. So um, thank you for continuing this event, despite these, these um, uh, extenuating circumstances. Now, I, I want to begin by talking a little bit about how I ended up writing a novel, because I was really known um, by most people until just a few years ago as an academic. I taught at the University of Toronto for many years. Can everyone hear me? Is my voice coming through clearly? It's as I, I mentioned to Simon earlier, I'm just getting over COVID. So <laughs> I had it a few weeks ago. It's basically gone, but my my voice is a little bit muffled. 
So I hope if, if you can't hear me, please let me know. Um, as I was saying, getting back to what I was saying, I was known mostly as an, as an academic. I taught uh, Hebrew and Yiddish literature at the University of Toronto for many years. I trained as an academic. I have a PhD from Brandeis University. And um, I was teaching literature for all these years. And then I decided to take a different course, which was a little bit <laughs> um, daunting. And it didn't happen overnight because what I started to do was I started to write creative literature. I started to write um, fiction myself. And I think what happened was I had always been very artistically inclined, even as a child. Um, and I wanna go back to that a little bit because people are always wondering, you know, how did I end up becoming a fiction writer and where did this all come from? You know, I was a professor for so many years, you know, why did you suddenly, you know, shift gears? And I don't think it's completely unexpected if you knew me from way back when. Um, I was always very artistically inclined. And when I was a child, I was always drawing and painting and playing music and singing. And I was just involved in the arts. And, um, and then as a teenager, I ended up getting involved in theater. And I was very involved with the um, theater world in Toronto when I was about uh, 17, 18. I acted in a number of plays in the um, sort of semi-professional world of theater. Back when, one of my claims to fame is that I was in a play with the late Gilda Radner and uh, from Saturday Night Live. And um, I mean, I was still sort of a kid at the time. She was, I was probably 18, she was 25, but I thought she was this older woman. <laughs> But she was incredibly kind to me, took me under her wing in a way and um, encouraged me. But it was around that time that I was, I was still in high school at the time. I was, I was in plays and acting. And I thought that I was going to be pursuing an artistic career of some sort or an acting career that I started becoming interested in other things. Now, I was always a big reader and I was always very, um, I was a good student. I, I loved school and I, applied myself. So I was always pulled in these two directions. And around the time I was in the theater, something fortuitous happened. I entered a used bookstore. I used to go to used bookstores a lot, which I still do. And I discovered two books while I was there. One of them was by Martin Buber, I and Thou, the famous, his famous magnum opus, you could say, uh, or I don't know if you call it magnum opus. It was just the book that he became ad identified with book of Jewish philosophy. And the other was a book of short stories by Shmuel Yosef Agnon, the great Hebrew writer. And um, I bought these books and brought them home and it completely changed my world. I suddenly realized there was all this wisdom and beauty that could be found in Jewish literature. And I knew nothing about it. I, I grew up in a Jewish home that was somewhat traditional, but really not that educated. We had some Jewish books in the home, but nothing of great profundity. I really didn't, I was a teenager. I really didn't know that much about, about um, the depths of Jewish learning or the scope or, or the, or the fact that Jewish literature could be anything but just, um, you know, shtetl tales. So when I discovered uh, writers such as Agnon and then the philosophy of Martin Buber, I, my world changed and I decided I wanted to study these people. I wanted to go to university and pursue Jewish studies in one form or another. So I, I went to the University of Toronto. I had actually taken a year off school when I was in the theater. My parents were extremely distressed and you know, were very upset that I, I even took a year off, but I, I promised them I would go back and I did. Went to university and I studied with the great Jewish philosopher, Emil Fackenheim at the University of Toronto who became quite an influence on me, I would say. And I began a whole pursuit of the academic study of Judaism. And I learned Hebrew and I went to Israel and I, I started to seriously pursue this Jewish studies academic career. And then I ended up transferring to Brandeis. And um, in the end, I, I finished my bachelor's degree there. I did a master's and then a PhD while I was at Brandeis. And I ended up doing a PhD in Hebrew literature on Shmuel Yosef Agnon. I wrote my PhD on him and I ended up publishing it as a book later. 
So that seemed as if my course in life was fixed, that that's what I would do. And I would be, you know, an academic and that would be fulfilling. And to some extent it was, I came back to Toronto with my husband at the time, you know, we got married not that long before. And we came back to Toronto. We were both originally from Toronto. We both ended up getting jobs, which was kind of miraculous considering how hard it is to get academic positions, but it was a little easier then. Um, And, I got a job. They needed someone at, at, U of, at U of Toronto to teach Yiddish literature. And because I was partially trained in Yiddish literature and Hebrew literature, I was studying, I was teaching Yiddish literature there for many years and then switched into Hebrew. My husband got a job in Jewish philosophy there and um, we stayed and we just, I kept teaching. But there was something gnawing at me. The, the, I guess it, what you could say it was that artistic inclination that wasn't really fulfilled by just teaching literature. I Every time I taught literature, I felt envious. I felt I'm analyzing it. I'm showing students how to take it apart and how to understand it. But I felt like I wanted to be producing this. I didn't want to just be teaching it. So one day I sat down at what was then a typewriter, believe it or not, it was that many years ago, it was before I even had a computer. So it was a long time ago. I sat down at the typewriter and I just started to write. And I thought it was a short story and I wrote part of it, put it away, kept taking it out, adding to it, putting it away. And it became the kernel for this book, Come Back For Me. I didn't have a title. I didn't even know what it was, whether it was a short story, but I felt compelled, almost like I had a mission. I had to write it. And over many years, I kept adding to it and I kept changing it and I revised it. And I realized I had a novel and I realized that I wanted to finish it almost more than anything in my life. So I took a break from teaching and I decided I was going to finish this novel no matter what. And I did. I revised it, though. I actually rewrote it three times. And it actually ended up being very different than it was in the beginning. Uh, As you know, the people who have read it know that there's a dual narrative. In the beginning, it didn't have a dual narrative. Um, The main two characters, Arthur Mandelkorn and Susie Cohn, were in the novel. But the narrative was not the back and forth structure that I ended up choosing when I revised it. I realized when I did revise it, it was a much stronger novel, but you know, it took me a long time to figure out exactly what I wanted to do, but I was driven by this passion to finish this work. So that's in a way how the whole thing started. Now, people always ask me, they always ask me, and probably some of you might have that question that is waiting to be asked as well. are you a child of Holocaust survivors? Because a lot of people who write these sorts of works are themselves survivors, children or grandchildren of survivors. That's very common. Um, and I, I often surprise people by saying, no, I actually am not. I'm not a child of Holocaust survivors. My parents, my mother was born in Europe, but she came as a very young child before the war. My father was born in Canada to Polish Jews, but he was born in Canada. So no, I'm not. But there's a there's a big but in there, because I was surrounded by survivors, even though I was not a descendant of one. When I was growing up in Toronto, I grew up in a, it was a strange kind of thing, because I grew up in a neighborhood that was actually fairly non-Jewish, but there was a little enclave of Jewish people who lived on my street, and a lot of them were Holocaust survivors. In fact, my very best friend who lived across the street from me was the child of survivors. Her parents were from Poland and Austria. Her father was actually born in the town of Auschwitz or Uschwitzin. I was in their house every day when I was a child. And they were very unusual people. And that's a whole other story I'm not going to get into. But that I think that friendship, that core friendship that I had with this young woman, who was this girl who was my closest friend, had such an impact on my life. It was my home away from home. I was always there. And I was very close with her mother. And I 
really think that part of me, even on an unconscious level as a child, wanted to understand these people, want to understand what made them tick. And one of the biggest questions I had was not, oh, you know, they're so damaged, uh, um, you know, what did they experience that caused them to, to become, um, or what did they go through? It wasn't even that. It was, how are they so normal? To me, they seemed fairly normal. They seemed, they had, they were married, they had children, they had jobs, they had careers. How did they go through what they went through and end up in, in a, a position where they were able to live relatively normal lives? And I think that question haunted me. And there were others on my street that I grew up with. It was a very similar sort of thing. There was a woman who lived down the street who had been hidden in a in a closet in Amsterdam. At least that was the story that went away around the street for years. And she ended up, they moved to my street, married, had children, I knew her children. There were many of these sorts of people that I grew up with. So I think that in a sense, not being a child of survivors gave me a certain objectivity. I was able to stand back. It wasn't really my experience being a child or a grandchild of survivors, but it was the experience of a lot of the people I was surrounded by. And I think that gave me, as I said, objectivity, but yet sensitivity and a desire to understand it without feeling it was necessarily my story. And in a, I, I think you could say that the story of Susie Cohn, a lot of people ask me, oh, is that you? Are you Susie Cohn? I say, no, I, I'm really, I'm not Susie Cohn, not at all. Even though some of the, the odd thing that she experienced, I could say, well, there's something sort of similar happened to me, but not really. She in a way is a composite of many other people I have known, but she's not really me. But when I write characters, when I when I create characters, I I, you know, become so immersed in their story that I'm sure there are parts of me or parts of people I know that are, that are in those characters, but they're not necessarily me or someone I know. In fact, when I first, um, I remember I was looking for an agent when I, was for, when I first finished the novel, uh, an agent wrote back to me and said, oh, this is so real. This must be based, this Arthur Mandelcorn must be, you know, your father, your uncle. I mean, obviously it is. And I said, no, 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 it's fiction. They're not, they're not people I know. She couldn't believe it. She thought for sure this is just a disguised memoir. And I said, no, no, it's fiction. And do it, making it fiction in a way um, allowed me that freedom to really allow my imagination to roam and to create scenarios that I felt would make a good story, but yet I felt driven to try to create the atmosphere of the times, both post-war times and the time of Susie Cohn's life, which was the 60s. I wanted to juxtapose those two times because my main interest was in survivors. I wasn't attempting to write a Holocaust novel per se. And I often remind people of that because they often say to me, oh, it's a Holocaust novel. Oh, I don't read Holocaust fiction. You know, a lot of people are like that. They say, I, it's too grisly, it's too depressing, I don't wanna read it. And I say, you know, it's not a Holocaust novel. It's a post-war story. It's a post-Holocaust novel. I wanna understand how people survived and survived well, even though I know a lot of people were completely destroyed by it. And I know families whose lives were destroyed by it, but I wasn't looking to, portray them. I wanted to understand how could it be that the that this devastation in Jewish life, greater than any devastation, including the, I would say, the, the destruction of the two temples in Jewish history, how could Jews survive and go on and build a sovereign state after the war? How is it they were able to do that? And of course, the building of Israel started many years before the war. But how were they able to do it? How did they transform themselves as a people? What role did Israel play? And that's a whole other side of the novel that really isn't Holocaust-based per se. And that's a whole other side of the role of Israel in the novel. Israel as a kind of redemptive source, a, a redemptive force in the life of the Jews. Now, this is something 
I have to say, is a very difficult thing to write these days. Uh, when I published the novel, I was aware of the fact that I was writing a novel portraying Israel, for the most part, in a very positive way, that it was integral to the resurrection of the Jewish people. And I don't mean that in a metaphysical sense. I mean it in a spiritual and a physical sense. Although some people would look at it metaphysically, I, I'm, I don't in any large way. But it's something that is very difficult for publishers today to want to support. They, you know, it's very, very difficult to get published if you're writing about the redemptive aspect of, 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 of Israel. You know, and, it, and I don't mean that in a religious sense, even in, in a, as I say, psychological and spiritual sense, very difficult. But I persisted, and this was true, you know, this has been true for quite a few years. I persisted, I was so determined to get this book published that I persisted and I got myself an agent and I, ended up getting published. Now, it wasn't published with Simon & Schuster, or although they were very interested, but in the end, didn't work out. Um, or Random House, you know, it ended up being um, um, acquired by a small press called the New Jewish Press, which was then acquired by the University of Toronto Press. Um, but they they were very professional. They did, I think, a beautiful job physically, good editing. So I was very happy with it. It didn't make the splash that I was hoping it would make. But, you know, that's not the point. I wanted to get it out there and I wanted people to read it. So really, that's one of the aspects of the writing of a novel like this is um, the struggle after you finish it to get it out to the world. And um, it is a struggle. I, I'm not um, trying to paper that over. It is a huge struggle. In fact, I'm facing it right now. I'm getting close to finishing my second novel. And I know I'm going to have to face this again. I'm going to have to face that this kind of difficulty, but I'm trying not to think about it because when I'm writing, I want to be pure in my thoughts. I don't want to have to think of the business aspect. Now, the other aspect of, of writing this novel and, and people's questions that they often have for me have to do with the fact that I said it originally in Hungary. And people always ask me, oh, you must be of Hungarian origin. And I always have to say, no, surprise, I'm not. I'm not of Hungarian origin. They always say to me, well, why did you choose to write about Hungary? And number one, I know a lot of Hungarian Jews. Toronto was a magnet for Hungarian Jews after 1956, when a lot of them were able to finally leave. And many Hungarian Jews settled in, in Canada, especially in the Toronto area. And my next door neighbors were Hungarian Jews and many other people I've known. I've always found them kind of fascinating because they're a very polarized community. They're, a lot of them are very assimilationist and try to deny their Jewish origin. I've known many Hungarian Jews who won't even admit they're Jewish, but I know they are. And I know others that are extremely ultra-Orthodox and, and um, uh, have gone to the complete other extreme. So, you know, it's kind of a fascinating uh, civilization. Now that's a whole other question of how that evolved in Hungary. Why did that happen there and not so much in other places? And that's not for today a question more for historians, but um, I chose Hungary, not just because I found Hungarians interesting, there was another reason, and that was, it was strategically useful for me to choose Hungary because I did not want to write about the war. I did not feel that I could honestly capture the experience of people who really went through it without feeling somehow as if I was fake in some way. I did not feel right about it. I, morally, I felt that there was something wrong about me as someone who's never undergone anything like that to try to capture what is almost impossible for those who are not there to capture. So I thought, I want to write about the survivors, but I don't want to write about or much about the war. So I thought, well, if I choose Hungary, Hungary was invaded so late, I can move the story very quickly from, from 
the end of the war to the post-war period without having to go through many years of skipping over facts. And that's really why I chose it because of its because of the fact that it was invaded so late and it allowed me to move past the war into the post-war period very quickly. Now, another thing people often ask me is, is this a book that can be read by most people? And I'm glad to say that I think it is, um, it, especially it's been taken up by people of all ages, which has surprised me in a way. Um, at a certain point, when I wrote, after I wrote the book and it was published, I and I don't even know how it happened, the book was discovered by an educational foundation in the United States. And they bought copies in bulk in order to distribute to schools for educational purposes. And this was for, not for young children, but for children in middle school and in high school. And at first I was sort of taken aback. I thought, well, I didn't write this for children. I wrote this as a book for adults. I wasn't intending. And even if you look on Amazon, it often says something like uh, such and such rank for young adult readers. And I always wonder, young adult readers, you know, I didn't write it for young adults. But yet, I think because... It has a fairly simple writing style. I, I, I've embraced a simple writing style. I tried not to, you know, be overly poetic. There's nothing salacious in it, or very little, that is. It's, it's a safe read. And also, because the protagonists are young, um, they're very young. They're teenagers when the story starts. So that it's something that I think young people can identify with because they see their own age group in this story. So in a way, it shouldn't surprise me. And then I said to myself, well, when I think of what I read in high school, often they weren't young adult books per se. They were books like, um, uh, you know, uh, books by Jane Austen or Shakespeare or, um, you know, Mark Twain. Those were the books that we were assigned. They weren't young adult writers. So, you know, it, I felt better about it. Now, actually, I'm actually incredibly pleased that the book is still every year apparently my publisher gets these bulk orders from this foundation and it's being distributed throughout the United States I don't know if it's happening in Canada or any else anywhere else in the world but I know it's it's been happening in the U.S. which I'm very very glad about so um as most of you know I don't know if there, if there everyone has read the book or you've come to this to learn about the book but um I don't some, think we'll, some, I will of, some of us some of us have definitely read it I yes it. And, I, <laughs> I, and I believe many I hope and I believe many of us have got questions but yeah please do carry on yeah. okay well I'm going to just um really talk only for a minute or two more because I do want to open it up the the um Florida questions because I know there are a lot of questions that people have about the book about writing historical fiction about the challenge of writing about this period so I think what I'm going to basically say is that, um, you know, there's always this struggle when writing about the Holocaust or even post-Holocaust, and that is, should we even attempt to write about it? You know, there was that famous quote by um, uh, Theodore Adorno that it's, a, it's, you know, a travesty. I don't know the exact words that to write poetry after Auschwitz. And... Um, or that it's obscene to write poetry after Auschwitz. I don't know if he meant that literally, but um, there is that sense that some people have that it's so, so impossible to grasp. The enormity of what happened is so impossible to grasp that it's almost a travesty to try to capture it because you're always going to be losing something you're always going to be doing some kind of disservice to it and disservice to the those who were killed and i agree with that to some extent and i feel that but yet at the same time when i think well then should we not write about it then that seems to me in a way to be more of a travesty because if you don't write about it then you are aren't you betraying those people who suffered who were you know, killed en masse. I mean, if you don't, if you're silent, isn't silence worse? So I, but I don't think that can be resolved. 
I, I don't think there's one answer to that. I think it's a kind of dialectic that the, there are two sides and they struggle with each other. And I think I struggle with that. Um, I struggled with it the entire time that I was writing. How much should I say? How much shouldn't I say? How much am I um, allowed morally to say? Can I speak in their voice? Who am I to feel entitled to speak in their voice? But if not me, then maybe someone less entitled will. So maybe I should step forward. So the, those are the kinds of conflicts, inner conflicts, I think writers about this period feel or should feel. Now, not all of them do. And there's a lot of schlock. I hate to say it, I you know, and maybe I shouldn't judge because I think sometimes that's an entree for people. You know, there are a lot of these schlocky books about the Holocaust that... <sighs> I can't bear to read, but yet some people read them and it's their way of, of entering the subject. It's their way of feeling compassionate, feeling horrified, uh, understanding it to some extent. And if that works for them, who am I to criticize? So yes, there's schlock, but um, maybe it has a function, I don't know. So I'm going to stop there. I've been speaking for half an hour and I know there are questions. I know we only have an hour. So I would like to open up the floor and, and uh, I'm happy to speak with people, find out what they think, what if they have questions about any aspect of the book, the title, <laughs> which is often fascinating for people, why I called it Come Back For Me. And I, there are a lot of different aspects of the story that people are often curious about. So please. If anyone has a question, um, Simon, do you want to choose? How, how, do, how should we do this? Uh, well, I'm, ha I'm happy to kick off as, as long as other people are happy for me to kick off. <laughs> the first question, um, Julian, I know from record, always has great questions. No pressure, <laughs> Julian. Um, and I'm sure many others do too. But if I may, um, to, to start, and to a degree you've covered quite a bit of this, I know from the record, this is your first novel, and it's clearly, as you've said, historical fiction. Uh, yes. My sense, and you've touched on it too just now, this form of writing gives you as the author freedom in terms of not needing to be concerned about the accuracy of the behavior and circumstances of the individuals featured, who being determined by you enables you to give a serious account of the historical events and circumstances that are being covered. So, so my question really is, what is your view of the advantages or risks in writing historical fiction in this way? Ah, that is a very good question. And I think there are always risks because when you're writing historical fiction, you're always aware of the fact that you might be getting certain aspects of history wrong. And there are things that you can do to misrepresent history. So I tried very, I was, I was very conscious of that fact that I might get certain things wrong, but I tried as much as I could to, um, to depict um, events and periods in a way that was at least believable, not to distort, but then you have much more latitude with the, with the uh, characters. With, with characters, you have a great deal of latitude because when you're writing, about characters, do you try to get to the truth of the way people behave? And that's a whole other thing. When you're trying to depict the way people respond to crises, to traumas, to, to love, uh, you know, that's a human instinct that I think as a writer, you have to mine within yourself. You have to go deep inside yourself and uh, try to understand what makes people behave the way they do. And I've always been someone who's been uh, fascinated by human behavior. I'm interested in human psychology. Um, <laughs> my husband often teases me that I like to <laughs> eavesdrop on people's, people's conversations in restaurants because he says, oh, there you are. You're getting some raw material, aren't you? And I say, no, no, I'm just, just interested. <laughs> but there is something to that. I like to know what makes people behave the way they do. And when I read books that don't 
seem um, authentic, don't seem humanly authentic. I, I, I'm, ver I'm very bothered by it. And what particularly bothers me, and I, I'm sure it doesn't bother everyone, I find it very hard to read books that I consider anachronistic. And when I say that, I mean books that try to read our times into the past so that the concerns that, you know, that, you know, uh, that people talk about today all the time, such as environmental activism or something like that, and they'll be writing about the 16th century and they'll have characters who are, you know, fighting for those sorts of uh, causes. And my antenna are up. I, I can't help thinking, no, <laughs> I don't know how much people were thinking about that then. You know, that again, to me, that's an anachronism and I'm often bothered by it. Not everyone is. Some people feel like it's creative to, to read our times back into, other, into earlier times. I don't like doing that myself. I try to be authentic to the time. And that's that's part of the goal that I set for myself. Thank you. Um, Julian, hi. Hi, uh, Sharon, thank you very much. Firstly, can I apologize? I haven't read your book yet, but I have some questions for you nonetheless. Sure. <clears throat> I was interested in terms of the historical fiction, some of the great novelists of, the, of our time have based very well-received and popular novels on historical facts where they pose the question, what if? So yeah. they come to a, a point in history and they just flip the answer to what really happened. So you have yeah. Robert Harris, who's done a number of great novels. Uh, there's another novel by a guy called Samson called Dominion, and it's set on uh, the 10th of May, 1940 in Downing Street, and Churchill is overruled and doesn't become prime minister. It's, uh, it's the great moments of history, what happens if? Yeah. Um, um, and obviously, you're, you know, you have the freedom once you are into that genre, provided you are authentic in terms of the historical reality, then you can make the story go wherever you want it to go. Like that gives you tremendous freedom. It does. Um, uh, and you contrast that with people that write novels that are very, very strictly accurate to the point of being pedantic because yeah. they feel they have to tell a story and they want it to be authentic. So I'm just looking at a couple of novels I just picked off my shelf now. Uh, Hans Fayard is alone in Berlin, for example, which is a, again, an unusual story, or a woman in Berlin, which is anonymous, but although they now know who the author probably was, these are based on very, very specific factual accounts. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so it's a different type of genre. But what actually I wanted to ask you in particular was the process by which you came to your, the final version of your novel. You said it went through two or three different rewrites. What prompted you to do that? Was that external pressures or suggestions or just feeling that you hadn't got it right? Uh, a little bit of both, but um, I'll, I'll explain how that happened. I went through, first of all, I went through three different agents. It's very hard to get an agent. I don't know if it's the same in, in England, but in US and Canada, it's very difficult to get an agent. You're, you know, there are tens of thousands of writers struggling to get the attention of a, you know, a very small group of agents. That's, that's, never had trouble. that's the key. Getting a very good literary agent. I happen to know a little bit because I have a son-in-law who's written two books and a son who's written one. Getting a good literary agent is the difference between succeeding and failing. And there's Absolutely. a number of really good literary agents. Yeah. There, yeah, exactly. And it's very, very difficult. But, you know, you think that all your problems are going to be solved when you get a great literary agent. It's not always true. My first agent was a world famous, I mean, world class agent who was the agent of some of the most prominent writers in North America. She loved the book. She said she's going to sell it. She couldn't sell it. She couldn't sell it. And that happens a lot. You don't realize it till you're there. It's devastating. You know, you finally get this amazing agent and then they can't sell it. Well, you know, instead of just, you know, crumpling into a ball and, and deciding that I'm not going to do this anymore, I, I picked myself up and I said, no, I'm going to figure out why she couldn't sell it. And I listened very carefully to what the editor said to whom she sent it. Now, part of it was the Times, you know, they don't want to hear about books about Israel unless you're just, you know, cutting Israel to shreds. There is that, but you can't rely, you can't lean on that too hard because that could also be an excuse. 
I wanted to understand, was there something in my book that needed changing and that maybe didn't really work? And what happens with agents, if they don't sell it, they drop you. <laughs> so I listened carefully to the criticisms and I decided at that point to restructure the novel. I did it once, got another agent, another world-class agent, <laughs> this time someone who represents one of the most successful writers ever. She also was convinced she could sell it. And again, it was the same thing. She couldn't sell it. Again, I was devastated. I mean, this was just like <laughs> a test. I, I almost think of my ability to, you know, test by fire of my ability to carry on, but I did. And again, I tried to learn from their criticisms because a lot of editors do offer criticisms. The problem is, is discerning which criticisms are valid and which aren't, because sometimes you get gratuitous criticisms and you look at it and you say, what are they talking about? Because sometimes they really aren't valid. So that, again, you have to be able to figure out what you can learn and what you can discard. Well, I rewrote the novel a second time. She also dropped me <laughs> and I ended up getting a third agent with whom I am still a client. And with her together, we sold the book. But it was because of those criticisms that I received and the sense or the knowledge that I am a new writer. I Yes, I taught literature for all these years, but I'm not an experienced fiction writer. I need to learn the process. I need to be able to be flexible enough to be able to rewrite, restructure, and not feel that um, I'm losing something. It's very hard because, but you know, there are little tricks you can play as well. For example, when you're rewriting, you all often have to delete large portions of what you've written. It's very difficult to say, okay, after spending months on some, a few chapters, and then you're just going to what erase it? Well, I have a little trick that I play with myself and it works. I, I discovered this, keep a file, on my computer, deleted sections. I put all those deleted sections in that file. So you, you fool yourself in a way you say, well, I haven't really deleted them. I just moved them over there. Maybe I'll use them at a later point. Well, I never have used them at a later point, but at least you know they're there. It makes it a lot easier. It's very difficult to just you know, erase material that you've worked so hard on. And you might really like some of your lines. It's very hard to to give that up but you have to be brutal in a way you have to be able to look at your work and say no this is not necessary there's a section that doesn't work and you have to get rid of it or you're shooting yourself in the foot well that's so very interesting I, I tell you why because I, I guess I'm not a novelist but I have a novel inside me I've always felt uh, a novel inside me and a year or two ago I started drafting it and I prepared a, a sort of a summary, an overview, and the first chapter. And yes. I'm in a club, and there's a guy at the next table talking to clearly his literary agent. Ah. So after the conversation, I said, I'd like to talk to you. I said, I'd like, I'd like to run something by you just to see what you think. And I yeah. sent it to him, and he said, he said, he was quite damning. He was quite damning, and probably quite rightly so. He said, you don't have a voice. This doesn't tell me what your voice is, and I uh, thought it was a great. I thought it was a great story. Um, it's a, it spans sort of thirty or forty years. It covers a Jewish family pre-war, during war, post-war, and it comes to its uh, crescendo at the time of the nineteen sixty-two uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, so that's the, that's that all the all the, the loose strands come together uh, with the resolution of the Cuban Missile Crisis and and the input of the various parties to get to the resolution. So I thought it was quite a, a neat, um, uh, quite a neat plot, and I thought it could be based on, you know, like Robert Harris does, meticulous research because there's so much yeah. information available. But he said to me, and I, I took this so much to heart. He said, you know, "I don't hear your your voice," which means yeah. he didn't he didn't understand what I was trying to say or maybe the way I was trying to say it. I just put the finger in. I haven't gone back to it. So the question is, did you ever have those feelings at some stage? Well. I, you know, I'm not going to get it away. I can't. I can't sell it. People don't like it. People don't want it. It's, it's not properly structured. But obviously, you you had that persistence to go back and see it, see it through. 
Yes, yes. I, I guess I, I just had faith in the work itself that it had, I guess I felt that it did have a voice. And yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. It's, if you feel that, that, I mean, I've read, I've read pieces of literature where I don't empathize with the characters. And I think that's where there's a lack of voice. You have mm -hmm. to be able to make your characters interesting enough and likable enough so that the readers want to continue reading and want to know more about them. And I felt that I had achieved that. Part of how I do it is I think of it as a kind of film. I always have a film in my mind. I always imagine it as a movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just a technique I use and it works for me. So, but don't give up. It sounds like actually an interesting <laughs> premise. <laughs> Um, maybe you can still rework it. I think I mean, but the time, these things obviously take a lot of commitment in terms of time. So it you must be very disciplined. Um, not always. <laughs> I can go through periods where I am working every day for hours, and then I'll go for months where I leave it. Oh, right. Okay. Months. And um, I get stuck. And then I just leave it. And I, I have, I just tell myself, you'll come back to it. And I do, I always come back to it. And um, that's just the way I work. Uh, I don't have a regular schedule. People always say, oh, do you work every morning at eight in the morning or or whatever? No, no, I don't, I, I can't even tell you what my schedule is. So, Thank you for your time. Thank it's you. a bit idiosync idiosyncratic perhaps, but. We have a question from Mona. Hi. So first of all, this is so fascinating. Um, I, I I really enjoyed the book, and and I read it because I'm your friend, your new friend. Yes. And I, <laughs> wonderful. <clears throat> the whole question. And Mona's husband. Mona's husband was my professor at Brandeis. So <laughs> we rediscovered our, each other, or we I discovered each other. That's right. Uh, and um, there's something about. Well, so we met, right, and we hit it off in uh, over dinner in Jerusalem outdoors, and. Um, there's something about the meeting between the reader and the writer that I'm really interested in. And in this case, the potential agent or critic and the writer. Yes. And um, I, I'm just fascinated by it. I, I wrote a book, but it was a very different process. Norton asked me to write a book, a nonfiction book about my work as a couples therapist and neurobiology. And um, it's a fascinating book, I'll tell you. <laughs> And so I didn't have to sell it, which was really important. I counted on Norton to do the marketing. You know, I, I did when I was able to do gigs to talk like this, I, I certainly did. But I didn't go through the agony. I can only imagine what the agony is to send it to people who are whose job it is to be harsh or critical. Yes. Most to loving, right? So I said it to my loving friends who said, you know, you're missing this or that, or you could tighten up here or there, or you might as well, you should really cite this person. Um, but but there was a like a loving listener on the other side and the whole dynamic I've never really thought about this with someone like you who's writing fiction doesn't have my, my, my Norton editor said now with publishing you have to have a platform in order to get published yes. what's a platform either you're a professor at Harvard or you have a million followers on some social media platform. yes yes so or you're a well-known journalist or yeah right or you have an agent who somehow says who lights up and says yeah I'll, I'll i'll do it but the whole issue of and when you write a book i mean it's like giving birth to a child at least that was my experience it's and you want the book, and, and then you give the book to the world and the world loves it or hates it or something in between they make of it what they do um and and you so yearn for that book to be cherished right and i'm just thinking about the dynamics of of dealing with a a potential agent whose whose job I guess it is to be a little bit harsh or maybe accepting um, so that they can then sell it to and then there's all these selling things right yes yes and then beyond that commercial, a commercial property yes. so once you get published there's this whole other thing of like being smooth and savvy in terms of social media marketing it's a whole oh, yes. other oh, process yes whether it's fiction or nonfiction. Absolutely. And I had, I, I, had, I had no clue. I mean, when I was writing like you, I was like in the zone and it took me four years and I'm just writing and I, I never thought about, and it also the world changed during those years that like, you know, the whole social media thing exploded. But just the whole dynamic of you're a writer, you give birth to this book and then you've got to 
like sell it as a commodity to the world. Anyway, I just wanted to share those thoughts because I think- Yes, it's- well, it's almost like entering your child into a beauty contest. Right. And, you know, it's it, you feel like you're in a way exploiting your product right. and there's something kind of unseemly about it. Right. I always feel very mixed about it. I am on social media. I do it, but I do it with a heavy heart. I don't really like doing it, but I know I have to. That's just the way things work nowadays. But it is, there is something that feels a little oily. <laughs> so well, I, I can tell you my son-in-law, uh, who, he's, he's done two books. He's doing his third. He's, he's under contract. On it. He's on social media all the time. And he's yes. always, and he's got a whole sort of set of people who he's appealing to, throwing questions out, getting responses. And my sense is he enjoys it. It's it's fun. Um, well, you can, you can get into it. I mean, sometimes I can enjoy it, but um, most writers are very private people. A lot of us are very shy. And um, so it, it goes against the grain to some extent, not not everyone's grain, but it goes against the grain of many writers. Some people, they can't give talks. They just can't. They ju- they're they much too um, in- inward. or in- So, I mean, I've never been that way. And I always say, well, it was good. I was in the theater when I was a kid or a teenager because I don't mind giving talks. I don't mind speaking publicly. And <laughs> I taught for so many years. So I'm very comfortable speaking publicly, but a lot of writers cannot bear it. So it's... Um, it's it's there's a whole business to it beyond the writing that you have to be able to embrace unless you're so successful that you're you're and this is so rare that the, you're a writer who can be reclusive like Philip Roth or someone like that or J.D. Salinger and it doesn't matter nowadays very it's almost impossible you have to be out there and um, it's it's difficult. But you also have to have, a, I think part of the key is self-confidence. And my husband always teases me. He says, well, your parents adored you. So, you know, <laughs> you you have that inner confidence that I think comes from um, having a childhood where you were very um, cherished by your parents. And I know he's joking, but there's something true about that. That I think if you grew up in a home where you were um, given a lot of um, confidence in your abilities, it helps even when you're an adult that you feel you have that inner strength to feel like, yes, I can do this. I can do this. You can beat me up all you want, but I can do it. Do you think someone like Philip Roth would publish the books today that he published in the 50s and 60s with the pressures that he might have got from social media? That's a really tough question. I don't know. I mean, Philip Roth is such an uh, was such an unusual character, and his books were so each one was so different from the other. It's hard to say. I, you know, I, I really couldn't even answer that. Um, does anybody have any other um, questions? Uh, because I'm conscious that time is running out, but I do. Just, okay. <laughs> just in case nobody else does. Uh, just. I was intrigued. You describe the, the attitude to Zionism and to, to live in Palestine as being something that Hungarian residents were concerned not to openly identify with because it, it portrayed a lack of loyalty to their country, Hungary. But was it not also the case there was a great deal of suspicion about the idea of going to live in Palestine and the establishment of a Jewish state based on how long and well established Eastern European um, uh, people had been at that to how long they'd been there in some cases 800 years 500 years so this concept of going to Palestine and Zionism wasn't necessarily all that popular even amongst the, the most religious it was not at all popular so you, absolutely yes well I mean it really depends on on your you know the the social group to which you belonged I mean there were very fervent Zionist groups forming in in Eastern Europe um maybe not so much in Hungary, but there were, but even there, there were, you know, these early forms of, of um, you know, groups that were forming to prepare themselves for, for life in Israel and, and preparing themselves for a whole new way of being, you know, working the land and, and transforming themselves, changing their names. That was very, um, very much part of changing one's whole identity. 
changing your name, giving it, a, you know, a, trying to achieve strength, um, overcoming what was perceived as Jewish weakness and apologetics to becoming uh, a person of self-determination. Those were all things that Zionism allowed Jews to do. And that's why I, when I was talking about what it meant spiritually and psychologically um, for Jews to go live there, it wasn't just that it gave people shelter, physical a physical place to go to, but it also allowed them to reclaim their identity and, and transform themselves into a whole different type of person. And that's why in the book, if for those of you who've read it, and even for those of you who haven't, I deal a lot with, with um, changing identities, people who are trying to conceal their identity, or a lot of characters in the book that are trying to hide who they are, who change who they are, who, who through, go through various processes of concealment and then revealment. So, um, so it, and I talked a little bit about the title being evocative. And I think when I called it Come Back for Me, I didn't mean it just that one of the characters actually states that line, the younger sister Manya calls to her brother, calls out to him to come back for me when they're separated during the war. It isn't only about that. It's about coming back to yourself. It's about coming back to a new form of yourself, perhaps, or coming back to the authentic form of yourself. And there's a lot of that that goes on in the novel. Uh, there are various characters who are running away and have to find a way back. So the whole idea of coming back, you could call it tshuva, you know, the, the spiritual return, or you can call it just um, rediscovering one's identity without apology. What's interesting, uh, and it's probably too big a subject in the three minutes we, we have left, yes. but the whole concept of the survivors um, when they came, those who came to Israel um, yeah. and effectively hid there, they felt guilt. Why were they the ones that survived? And yeah. those who were resident there were strong going forward and didn't have time for so, it. was literally only the Eichmann trial that sort of enabled survivors to kind of come out and reveal themselves and so on. So it's, there's a lot to that psychology. Yes, yes. And I was trying to... Um, trying to grasp that as much as I could through both the characters and towards the end of the novel, when, when the, the two characters come together in Israel, I was trying to, from, from very, I mean, they were coming from two different worlds, but yet they were both struggling with similar dilemmas about how to go forward, how to go forward after trauma, but yet also after hiding who they are. And um, they aren't the only characters, though, who do hide who they are and, and have to rediscover themselves. Thank you. What, what, I'm very conscious because we keep we try to make it one hour. and We've got two yes. minutes to go. So first of all, I want to say a huge thank you on behalf of all of us for speaking the way you have and revealing everything you, you, have, you did about what you have done in creating the book and writing more and so on. So really grateful. Uh, thank I you. To, I also want to let everyone know that our next uh, book is a book called The School That Escaped the Nazis. It's by a woman called Deborah Cadbury, who has agreed, as you have done, Sharon, to, uh, tonight, to do the same for us then. I don't actually have a fixed date yet for it, but I have read the book, and it is sensational, all about a, a school called in the UK, Bunce Court, where she literally took a school from uh, Germany and brought it here to the UK, and it became a school that so many survivors, as in children, uh, were able to come to. But the whole uh, basis of, of what she writes is fantastic. So I look forward to this as our next book, and we'll circulate all the details uh, together with the proposed date. Um, um, and that's that's sort of just about it at 2059. <laughs> minutes ago, uh, so a huge thank you. And does anyone else have anything else they want to say? Thank you very much. Very interesting. Agreed. Okay, really nice to meet you. I know you and I will continue to be friends because you have accepted me as a friend. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> I look forward to staying in touch. And thank okay. you everyone for attending. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming. Great to, great to see you all here. Thank you.